Hi. So I shall be presenting to you. My name is Brendan Sabrians, by the way. I shall be presenting to you my senior sim presentation for this for this slam occasion, which was based on truth and reconciliation commissions in the USA. Now, the reason why I chose this was because of an incident that actually occurred over the summer. So sometime, I think it was July, I was knocking with my roommate at the time. He was a white guy from Virginia, and he were knocking in the same neighborhood. We split up in half. Cops came for him at about 11 o'clock in the morning, and the guy was super sweet. You know, he actually said, nah, don't worry about it. You can actually keep knocking in the same neighborhood. Just like, don't knock in this particular section of the neighborhood. I was like, okay, cool. Carried on during the day. I was just doing my rounds. And then on the same day, about four cop cars came by. It was about 4 or 5 p.m. Four cop cars came by. They came out super aggressive. They were interrogating me. You know, a bunch of questions that were asked. And this, obviously, like, it left me emotionally traumatized for a little bit. And it led me to writing this paper. So you might be asking, what are truth and reconciliation commissions? So truth and reconciliation commissions are official non-judicial bodies of a limited duration established to determine the facts, causes, and consequences of past human rights violations. By giving special attention to testimonies, they provide victims with recognition, often after prolonged periods of social stigmatization and skepticism. TRCs can contribute to prosecutions and reparations through their findings and recommendations, assist divided societies to overcome a culture of silence and distrust to help to identify with, to help to identify institutional reform needed to prevent new violations. Now, there's three key things to this slide, uh, which I'd like to just look at. Uh, so the first one will be past human rights violations. So the past human rights violations in this case will be that police brutality that has occurred over the period of America's existence between black people and the police. The second one will be social stigmatization. Now the social stigmatization, as you can see here, is obviously the perception that black people have in America that the cops are dangerous. And obviously this is through past actions. And the last thing will be just fixing a divided society, assisting divided societies to overcome a culture of silence and distrust. A lot of black people in America feel like they cannot trust the government, the system, or police in particular. So this is what the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions will be out here to fix. Now we'll base our research off uh, a very popular Truth and Reconciliation Commission that occurred in South Africa. Now, if anyone knows, South Africa was plagued with this, with a regime uh, known as apartheid. So it was when the white, major white minority controlled the black majority in the country, it was almost perfect racism at the end of the day. So what they did was they managed to suppress uh, the black people. And what they did was they stripped them of their voting rights. There was the Bantu education system, which was an education system that ensured that black people would stay in low paying jobs, not giving them the right education to move up. So what happened in, as you can see, there's a picture of Nelson Mandela, so Nelson Mandela came in as the NC president and they obviously took over the government and he came in with the conception that instead of getting revenge, let's try and reconcile both sides. So they established these truth and reconciliation commissions. It was mainly him and Desmond Tutu who were leading this. Now, what they did was they looked for human rights violations that occurred between 1960 and 1994. This was 1994 was the end of apartheid and when the ANC took power. So within this period, so what these Truth and Reconciliation Commissions looked like in South Africa, they were rooms packed with black people, white people, perpetrators and non-perpetrators. And it was a very tense and, you know, it was, it was a moment, it was a moment in time. So about 15,000 victims came, came over, gave statements over 18 month period. Perpetrators were granted amnesty. So what amnesty was or is, <laughs> is this basically, if you came forward and you admitted to doing these crimes, you were granted, you wouldn't go to jail, you wouldn't be persecuted for any of your actions. So that was the whole key of it, for people to get the truth, but for the country to reconcile at the same time. Because if you punish them, then it wouldn't be, it was more like revenge. So that, that was the whole purpose of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. If you look at South Africa today, they are very diversely represent, represented in their, in their parliament. They're actually the second highest GDP, GDP country in the whole of Africa, they're just second to Nigeria. And right now they are part of the developing nations, which are Brazil, Russia, India, C and South Africa, what the last one is. But anyway, the next country we'll look at which uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions occurred under was Rwanda. 
So in Rwanda, if anyone knows, there was a genocide in 1994, right? It was between the Hutus and the Tutsis. Hutus were slaughtering the Tutsis. And a million people were killed within 100 days. Now, there was obviously a need for some sort of restorative justice after this genocide because they couldn't just go un, undealt with, you know, because it was a million people killed in 100 days. And it was neighbors slaughtering neighbors, people who knew each other just slaughtering each other. And it was, it was crazy. Now, the issue with Rwanda was that their judicial system wasn't effective enough to actually deal with all of the cases because what happened, they actually, there was a statistic that said if the judicial system had went on and looked at all the cases, it would have taken them about 283 years to prosecute every single person. So what happened was they came up with the supplementary judicial system known as the courts. Now these are called, the, these in direct translation is to sit down and discuss an issue. So what happened was some people were sent to prison, obviously the high perpetrators within that judicial system. And then there was a community-based reintegration program that was, that was dictated by these courts. This was simply to allow people to live with each other at the end of the day, because it was unlivable for about that 100-day period. People, like I said, neighbors were neighbors. If you look at Rwanda right now, they have universal health care. They actually had a 10% economic growth in in 2019, and they're all probably a model for most African countries to look at to this day. They're actually aiming to achieve high income status by 2050. Now, a lot of this can be put down to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we'll take it back to the USA. Looking at the history of police brutality, there was a slave code, obviously slaves came in from Africa and there had to be a policing system to keep them down. These were the slave codes, the police, the police at the time obviously made sure that slaves were not trying to leave, doing all this, doing all this. Emancipate, the Emancipation Proclamation came about and all this led to was the Jim Crow law, uh, laws in the South. What happened here was policing became done by every individual in society, from ushers at movies, from police drivers, I mean, <laughs> from bus drivers to literally anyone because these Jim Crow laws were dictating the whole racial system at the time in the South. Jim Crow laws were ended. Then what happened was the new Jim Crow was in, was in, Jim Crow was in place. And this was under the war on drugs. Now the war on drugs was, was brought about by Nixon and Reagan at the time. And it just led to mass incarceration of black people, of African-Americans. The jail population actually grew from 350,000 to 2.3 million in a 21 year period. This was because Policing was just increased, more was invested into it, and it was made sure to target these African-American people. This obviously caused a lot of distrust, and no matter what seems to happen, if you look at the current judicial system in the USA, it's inefficient in dealing with collective trauma issues. So what I mean by collective trauma is, if you look at George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, all these incidents that have occurred, even if there's a settlement, people will still be traumatized by looking at that video of George Floyd, you know? You look at it, he gets his neck stood on, you literally see the man dying. And no judicial system is in place to actually deal with that collective trauma that African-Americans are feeling right now. So typically what the judicial system in the USA is trying to do, they're trying to strike a deal. If you look at Breonna Taylor, they got a 12 million settlement. George Floyd's uh, prosecution is currently underway and it's probably gonna lead to the same thing. There's not gonna be a effective way to deal with this collective trauma. So what I believe should happen is there should be community-based truth and reconciliation commissions. This is because only communities can fix communities, okay? So I have three recommendations for these commissions. There should be the Civil Rights Violation Committee, com com yeah, committee, which will be from 1994 to up to 2020. The reason why this period is because in 1994, that was the introduction of the Crime Bill, which was actually, which actually expanded the whole policing system and targeted African-Americans significantly. The second one will be reparations and rehabilitation, the R&R Commission. Now, what this will be mainly about is just getting those people counseling, you know, taking on their mental health, because that's very common within the African-American community to just neglect mental health. Like I'm sure people right now are still dealing with the issues of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and stuff like that. The third will be the Amnesty Commission, whereby people come forward, these police come forward, 
they say their piece, they say what they did, they admit to it, so they don't get prosecuted. Now, there's, now for these to be, for these to actually work, these truth and reconciliation commissions, they need to be run by local governments for, their, for legitimacy purposes. If a bunch of random people do it, it's not gonna work. So it has to be a government run thing, but the only, it has to be run by local governments, not by the federal government. Because if it's run by the federal government, it will be politicized. And we'll get to the to a way of detaching politics from this, because as we can see, as we've seen with COVID and like incidents that happened over this 2020 period, everything in America gets politicized regardless of what it is. So interest groups will need to be an important driver of implementing these truth and reconciliation commissions. Interest groups such as businesses, schools, churches, civil and human rights groups such as the Black BLM and NAACP. Now, the way to detach uh, the entire uh, political, uh, political side of it is through pitching this as a profit incentive kind of driven thing. Because if you look at it, places such as Minnesota have actually faced decreases in their, in their businesses, such as tourism, because who's gonna want to come to a place? Who's gonna wanna study at a place where they can literally kneel on your neck and you can die? You know what I'm saying? They even, they even started a campaign known as See You Soon, which was to try and get people back into Minnesota because they realized they were losing a lot of money from this. So if you pitch it in a way that businesses see it as a, there's a profit incentive to it, you can detach that political side of it. And then you can undergo these, these truth and reconciliation commissions with the help of that local government and the communities. It should be community-based, like I just said. And at the end of the day, communities are very diverse. Communities at the end of the day, know what's best for them. And uh, a very, very common thing that seems to be happening in America is these quick fix things. So if communities know what's best for them, they're not gonna be after these quick fix things. So what I mean by these quick fixes is, if you see after there's been something like the George Floyd incidents, they might have banned chokeholds, or I can't remember what exactly it was, banning chokeholds. This was a quick fix, quick fix, um, Thing done by the federal government or the local government, state governments to, to say that, okay, this won't happen again. This particular thing won't happen again, but it seems to happen, happen all the time after that. So these quick fix things are not actually the solution. They need to be wholesale changes that will come about. And I think just as a basis, something that could, use be, could be used as a base, just bounce off. Uh, I just give three suggestions of wholesale changes. Now, the first one will be the drug stigmatization. If you look at the opioid pandemic and the crack pandemic, crack pandemic happened in the 80s. Opioid pandemic, we're actually, occurred, we're actually dealing with it right now. Crack was black, opioid was white. Crack, in the crack pandemic, people were put in jail. It was stigmatized that these people were feminine, these people were evil, you know, these people were doing the wrong thing. But with the opioid pandemic, it's, it seems to be more driven with mental health issues, you know? So just changing the stigmatization and not looking at African-American drug abuse as a crime, but as a mental health issue can be one way of starting to transition into reintegrating society. Incentivizing the hiring of felons. If you look at it in the USA currently, if you're a felon, you're almost detached from society, you're ostracized because you cannot get a job. You might even lose your voting rights in some states. Now, that alone is not a way it will never manage to reintegrate society. So you have to incentivize uh, job owners to actually, <laughs> employees to actually employ people who are felons. This can be through tax breaks, through monetary incentives, just stuff like that. And thirdly, what I would just uh, suggest is controlling these 9-11 responses because at the end of the day, look at George Floyd. Look at me, for example. There was, there was no business having four cop cars there. There was no need to have four cop cars there. I was just a bad guy selling pest control. Why did four cop cars have to come? So controlling these 9-11 responses, maybe even when it's non-violent crimes, you know, getting someone who's more into counseling and, you know, a social worker instead of like a police who's trained to protect would probably be a, a good way to kind of get around this. Now, a big thing in America, we have to understand that there has not been a conversation about race. If you look at it now, there's people who deny that racism still exists in America when it does. 2020 showed us that it was very, very clear. There is racism in this country. 
And this truth and reconciliation could be the beginning of a conversation. So what this conversation is trying to lead to is actually a stepping stone for more truth and reconciliation commissions as attempts to fix other social aspects on just such as housing, education, jobs, and many other sectors that have been affected by racist history, racist policies, and things according to that. Now, I'd just like to leave and close with that with a quote from the author of The New Jim Crow, Ms. Michelle Alexander. She says, this new consensus must begin with dialogue, a conversation that fosters a critical consciousness, a key prerequisite to effective social action. And because of this, I strongly believe that truth and reconciliation commissions are the way to stop, to, to fix the racial divide in America. I, thank you very much.